Lord Jesus, I pray that you would meet us, God, as we dive into your word now. Would you speak to us, Lord? Would you cause your word to go deep into our heart, God, and to convict us and to bear fruit? God, would you help us to be people that are aware of you, Lord, and aware of your, your desires, God? And would you help us to be people that feel conviction, God, towards the things you want us to be convicted over? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, there's no intro for today's message because I told you what was going to happen last week. Who here was, who was here last week? Right? Remember I said we're going to do the family service and I found out last minute I had to change the message because today's text, we're talking about Judas being possessed by Satan. If you're visiting our church, this is a great Sunday to be here. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really glad you're with us today. If you remember what's going on in our story, Jesus is sitting with his disciples at the Last Supper, and they're sharing the meal, and it's kind of like the new covenant, and he's like, hey, you know, this body, you know, or this bread is broken, it's my body that's going to be broken for you, and take this wine and drink it. We're at this moment, and Jesus gets up, and he, and he takes off his outer robes, and he girds himself as a servant, and then he gets the water, and he gets the base, and he gets the towel, and he starts to wash the feet of his disciples and serve them. And if you were here three weeks ago, you would have gotten to sit through that message. And if you missed it, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it because there's something so powerful about the example of Jesus. And when he gets done serving his disciples, look at what he says with them. Chapter 13, verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, I want you to understand, contextually, chapters 13 to 17 are the same conversation. John's got a four-chapter stretch that constitutes Jesus' final conversation with all of his disciples. This is the night Jesus will be betrayed by Judas. It's the night he'll be arrested the next morning, Friday morning, he's going to be crucified. And John dedicates four chapters to this little conversation. And something Jesus is going to start hitting at over and over is his desire for you and I to love one another and to serve one another. In fact, when Jesus will tell us in John 15 that we abide in his love by keeping his commandments, this is the commandment he gives us that we would love one another. So Jesus says to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And that's where we ended last week's message. And it's kind of, it's kind of good. And it's got warm feelings to it. And Jesus talking about that if we practice our faith, there's actually a joy and a happiness and a blessing that you and I will experience. But in that same conversation... In that same phrase, look at what Jesus said, verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. And that's a quote from the Psalms. Now I tell you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So Jesus, Jesus is talking with his disciples. And, and you got to imagine, they're convicted, they're stunned. They're working through Jesus's humility and love towards them. He just washed their feet. And if you're familiar at all with things in that culture, then you would know that to wash someone's feet was like the lowest task you could do. It was like the ultimate form of, of servitude. And Jesus had just done that for them, and he's calling them to love one another 
in the same way. And then he goes on to assure them, though, that one of them is actually going to betray him. Now, Jesus had said this multiple times to them. But as he gets closer to the cross, it's becoming more real for them. And I want you to understand, these guys couldn't fathom that idea. Couldn't fathom the idea that one of them, one of their own, would betray the Lord. They were so committed to him. They were so dedicated to him. And Judas was so good about it that it came as a shock when Jesus said it. It's not like Jesus was like, guys, one of you is going to betray me. And like James is over there, he's like, I knew it. And it's Judas. Like, we all know it's you, Judas. Come on, man. Nobody knew. It came as a shock, but Jesus shares it ahead of time for an important reason. Look what he says. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Look at verse 19. Now I tell you before it comes to pass, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Jesus tells his disciples ahead of time that Judas is going to betray them, betray him in order to assure them so that when it happened, their faith would be stronger. Guys, I got to tell you this. This is something I love about Jesus. The closer we get to the cross, the more I see him assuring his disciples. Like it's going to be okay. In fact, next week's chapter, he's going to say, you believe in God? Believe in me. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus continues to assure his disciples. And what's so powerful about that is Jesus has been assured by his Father. Look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 13. Look what it says. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments. So Jesus has been assured of the Father. All things have been placed into his hands. Like, can you imagine that? Jesus knows that the next morning he's going to hang on the cross. But he knows that the victory is already his. And from that place of assurance, he then passes that on to you and me. Because this is what I want you to understand. Christ's victory is your victory. If you are a child of God, the fact that Jesus is victorious over your sin and death, that's your victory. And Jesus desires for you and I to receive from him his assurance towards us. And the two things he assures them out of in this text is his foreknowledge. He says, I know whom I've chosen, meaning Jesus already knows the whole story before it happens. And secondly, Jesus says that the scriptures would be fulfilled, speaking of God's plan and God's will. I got to tell you, that's a tremendous benefit to you and I. And if you're taking notes this morning, I would ask you to write this question down to reflect on later. But what area of your life is God assuring you? And what places of your life is God assuring you and asking you to let go and trust him? Because this is what I know. All of us are going through difficult things in our lives. We're all going through hard circumstances. We're all going through moments where we feel pinched or we feel stretched. We're all going through times where we feel challenged or we feel like there's a lack. And yet in all of that, God is wanting to assure you and I so that we would place our faith in him and trust him. God already knew this was going to happen. In fact, that's what he's telling his disciples right now. I already knew Judas was going to betray me. In fact, I picked Judas to do that. Blows our mind. Jesus picked Judas with the full knowledge of what Judas would do to him. And when Jesus looks at your life and your circumstances, he goes, I already know the full story. I know how this is going to end. I know how I'm going to work it together according to my will. That just as Romans would put it, or Paul would put it in Romans, that God is capable of working all things to the good of those who love him, who trust him. So in what areas of your life are you struggling today? 
And God is asking you to trust him. He's assuring you that he already knows you were gonna get here. That he knows what he's gonna do to see you through. That he knows the full extent of your life and your story. And that he's capable because he's all knowing and he's all powerful. He's capable of working it to a better ending than you can imagine. Guys, I'm so touched. The closer we get to the cross, the more and more I see Jesus assuring his disciples. I'm gonna talk on this again next week, but Jesus is using this word, or or John is using this word over and over again to describe Jesus, and we'll read it together now. Verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. That word is terasso. It means like deeply agitated, stirred up. Like there was a visible change on Jesus. He's deeply troubled. The first time John pulls that word out is when Jesus encounters Lazarus' grave. Do you remember it says he was moved, deeply troubled? Remember that he resurrected Lazarus from the dead? This is the same exact word and John's gonna use it over and over again because next week when we get to chapter 14, Jesus is gonna look at his disciples and he says, Don't you be, he's going to use the same word, troubled. And the idea is, is that Jesus was troubled on our behalf. So I can be assured in him. And so Jesus Jesus assures his disciples so that their faith would be strengthened. God wants to strengthen your faith through whatever you're going through today. And I, I do want to see verse 20 one more time because it's connected to verses 16 and 17. Jesus is finishing out his thought. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. And you're like, okay, my mind, I have a hard time wrapping around that. Essentially, this is what Jesus has said. Just as he's taken the assurance he's received from the Father, and he's given it to you and I, he also has taken the commissioning Just as the Father has sent him, Jesus is now turning and looking at his disciples into you and I. He's saying, I have sent you. And when you go forth and bear the gospel message and people hear that and they repent, they're receiving me. And through receiving me, they're receiving the Father. And I don't know if you've actually thought of it that way because you're like, "I I go to church, I'm a Christian, but do you actually believe that Jesus has sent you? If you're God's child today, do you actually believe that Jesus has commissioned you? Like on his list of pre-approved commissioned messengers in heaven, if you're a child of God, your name is on that list. You know, people might call you back, hey, you called the wrong person. And yet God's in heaven, like, no, your name's on the list. I told them to call you. You've been commissioned by God to do this work, to be his ambassador. And if that's a scary idea for you, I want you to understand you're not alone in it. We're breaking this whole segment up over a matter of weeks, but Jesus was sharing this in one conversation. And he's gonna get to the point where he's gonna say to them, guys, I'm gonna send to you my Holy Spirit. I'm not gonna leave you as an orphan. That the very presence of Jesus, the very Spirit of God actually abides in his children. And when God says he's commissioned you to do it, he's also empowered you through his spirit to do it as well. See where the assurance and faith come together here in our actions? So so what is my part? My part is just to trust him. To open my mouth and believe that he'll use me. That's all you got to do. And it doesn't have to be the most well thought out. It doesn't have to be the most formed. Some of you are like, I've never been to seminary. That's okay. Jesus wants to use you right where you're at to speak life and encouragement into others. He's commissioning you. When you get up tomorrow morning, and you look in the mirror and you're like, oh, it's a Monday. I hope Starbucks has a lot of coffee or whatever you're feeling, I want you to look in the mirror and just say to yourself, Jesus has commissioned me. You you may not not feel like it. You may be like, it's a Monday, but the reality is, is Jesus is sending you. And if people, and Jesus says this, if people receive you, they're receiving him. 
and through him the Father. So go out with boldness and confidence. You've been commissioned to be the messenger of Jesus. Now, this is so sad because Jesus makes it clear that not everyone's been commissioned, right? He's talking about Judas. He knows the one who's in their midst. And so verse 21, let's see it again. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Most assuredly, that means verily, verily in the old King James. It means this fact is certain and absolute. One of you will betray me. Matthew's gospel says that the other disciples started to ask the Lord, Lord, is it me? They were so distressed at that thought. They couldn't fathom it. That someone in this room would betray you, Jesus. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. So Matthew's gospel fills in that detail that they're asking Jesus, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And they're exchanging perplexed glances, but John's gospel fills in that Peter was in the corner doing like his baseball signs. He's at the dinner table. He's got John. He's like, John, say. No. And John's like, Checks the pan. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that play. All right? And if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen uh, a picture of uh, the, the last dinner where they're like leaning on each other and all that, this big straight table, that's actually not what it looked like. And I have a picture, if we can pull up that slide, guys, of what it probably little, would have looked a little bit more like. They, they would have sat at an oval-shaped table or a U-shaped table. And they kind of have Jesus in the wrong spot. I think that's supposed to be Jesus there in the middle. Jesus technically, if I understand this correctly, would have been on this bottom end. So this guy with the red tunic and the long, luscious, dark hair. Uh, <laughs> that's where John probably would have been sitting, right? He's on the right side. Then it would have been Jesus. And you guys can take that slide down. And the reason they know that and speculate that, and I told the media team ahead of time I was going to do this, because they actually reclined when they ate, like on the ground, like on a pillow, and you would lean on your left arm and you would eat with your right. So they're all asking Jesus, Lord, who is it who's going to betray you? By the way, you guys all look great from this angle. I just want to let you know. <laughs> and, uh, and Peter's like doing his signage thing to John. And John would have been on the right side of Jesus because he was capable of asking a question in a private way that nobody else heard it. And so when it says John leaned on his breast, you're like, what does that mean? Do you just kind of like splay on him? He's literally, Jesus is right here. He probably just leaned over on Jesus and said, Lord, who's the one who's going to betray you? Okay, now I, I, while I'm down here, I want you guys to think with me for just one second, okay? I want to engage your minds. John is able to have a private conversation with Jesus. And we know from the text, the rest of the disciples don't understand what was said between him, John, and Judas. So that tells you that John was right next to Jesus. Matthew's gospel also tells us that Judas asked the Lord if he was the one who would betray him. Do you remember that? He said, Rabbi, is it I? And what did Jesus say? Right? Jesus said, yeah, I know. But nobody else heard that. Jesus is also about to dip a piece of bread in the bowl and hand it to Judas. Where is Judas sitting at this dinner? On the other side of Jesus. This is what's so fascinating, friends, because that means nothing to us, but in that culture, that was the position of honor. At this, oh my gosh, it's so heartbreaking. You know, I've told you guys many times on Jesus' part, he was truly Judas's friend. And Jesus had given Judas every opportunity to repent and change. Even at this dinner, this final moment, Jesus had intentionally placed Judas at his side in the position of honor. Powerful, isn't it? That kind of love. You know what? You and I, if there's like a known suspect in the room, you and I treat them with like a very cold interest, don't we? We're like, I don't know, but that person's sus. That was a reference for all of you kids in today. I just... Glad you guys got that. Okay. He's like, I, I don't know. But Jesus, for the last three years, even though he knew, he knew Judas would betray him. Jesus never once treated him that way. 
Jesus treated him with love and kindness equal to the other disciples. And not only that, at the end, Jesus heaps it on even more. And so Jesus and Judas and John would have been at that bottom crook of that table. And so John leans in and he says, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, for us as well, we might go, that's like a really weird thing to do. Like, you know, none of us go to the restaurant and we're like, hey, I'm going to dip the chip and hand it to him. And you know that's the bad one, right? Like, in the salsa, there you go, buddy. Like, hope you choke on that, right? Like, <laughs> that's not what's going on here. In that culture, at that meal, it was actually traditional, at these feast meals, that the host would actually dip a piece of food and hand it to the most honored guest and to be like a toast to them. And so Jesus is actually honoring Judas when he dips it and he hands it to him. Like, you're the honored guest. And you know what? On the inside, I wonder what John was thinking. Like, no. It was Judas? The whole time. Like, and, and John's probably looking at Peter's kind of like, dude, signal me back. And John's like, I don't know what to tell you. And the other disciples, they don't, they, they're not in on this conversation. And when they see Jesus hand Judas that piece of bread, they were probably all thinking, you know what they're thinking? Uh, Judas is a real friend. In fact, when Judas got up to leave, they all thought highly of him. They're like, he must be running an errand for Jesus. In fact, you know, we're going to see it next week because it pars well with verse 14, but, or chapter 14, but Peter's going to say, Lord, I would die with you. And Jesus is going to say, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the roast, rooster crows tonight. Like that's going to happen in the same conversation. And there's a pretty good chance that most of the disciples were like, Peter's the traitor. Right? Peter's the one who's going to deny Jesus. No one suspected Judas. So close to Jesus and yet so far. And his story is so sad. Look at what it says. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. What a crazy, crazy moment. You know, this is one of those, this is one of those texts where you're like, when you, when you think really hard about it, you're like, this is a really weird scene. Here's Jesus, the last supper with his disciples, the Son of God. He's got John on his right, he's got Judas on his left, and Satan is hanging around the area waiting for a chance to snag Judas and use him. And when Jesus takes the bread and dips it and hands it to Judas and marks him as the traitor and Judas receives that, Satan actually bodily possesses Judas. Not like any other demon, like Satan himself. And that's a terrifying, that's a terrifying thought. And as I was studying this, you have to ask the question, what led us to this point? Like, what led us to this point? Where one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, one of those closest to Jesus, is bodily possessed with Satan. You know, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, because this is our second point. I want you to write this down with me. Rejecting the truth sets me up for destruction. Rejecting the truth sets me up for destruction. Now, Judas is a worst case scenario, right? I mean, this is the ultimate picture of somebody whose life was totally destroyed by the lie of Satan, but it's a really good lesson for you and I because what's taken place is for three years, Judas has been with Jesus. And somewhere along the way, he started to harden his heart and reject them. Like, you're not the Christ. You're not God's son. You're not the Messiah. Everyone speculates Judas's motives, and nobody really knows for certain. But what we do know is that Judas was willing to sell Jesus's soul for 30 pieces of silver. 
And when you and I read this story, it's easy to feel bad for Judas. Like, gosh, the guy got used. I want you to understand this. Judas was willing to betray Jesus. Here's the scary reality. Satan was willing to help him do it. And Judas found himself in a spot. He put himself in that spot by rejecting, 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 and selling himself to do evil. All he did was mark himself for Satan's purposes. Now, obviously, for you and I as God's children, it's like, look, you don't have to be like, oh, man, I disobeyed God. Now Satan's going to get me. All right, that's not how that works. I don't want anyone to be afraid. What I want you to understand is this, though. Whenever I reject truth, something has to fill that gap. In fact, if you guys can imagine with me like a VHS player. Do you guys know what a VHS is? (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? Okay, good. One person. That's awesome. I have to go back. What about cassettes? Okay, we, we've all seen cassettes in our life. Records? All right, well, let's go it's a little deeper. Um, I want you to imagine a VHS player. I remember growing up and we had like that VHS and you'd watch the movie and then you'd rewind it. And then the really cool ones, you could have one rewinding, one watching at the same time. Or do you remember the speed rewinding ones? Yeah, weren't those awesome? You put the movie in and be like, mm-hmm, and like, like wind up and sound like somebody was running the blender and you're like, hey, the video is almost rewound. So... I want you to imagine that because it's the perfect image. Your mind is like that box, that VHS box. And when you reject God's truth, you pull out that VHS and you spit it out. You got an empty player that Satan is just eager to slide something into. Because I I want you to see it this way. Like Jesus is the absolute truth, right? Like at the center of all things true, you will always find Jesus. And at the center of all real truth, there's God. Because all truth originates with God. Truth is not, truth is not an opinion. Truth is a divine ordinance. That's where we get ourselves in trouble in our culture. We think of truth as an opinion. Well, it's not true to me, but it, it's okay if it's true to you. Like Truth is like this fluid, ever-shifting concept. It's really not. Truth is a divine ordinance. So at the, at the center of all real truth, you'll find Jesus. This is why, and I I love this phrase, this is why it's true to say that all truth is God's truth. doesn't matter who came up with it. Like if it's true, it's because God said it was. So when you hear somebody give that great Gandhi quote and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I say? You're like, well, if it's true, you'll find the concept somewhere in the Bible. Because all truth at the end of the day is God's truth. And at the center of all real truth is Jesus. So there's not, if you were like, see, every road leads to heaven, it doesn't. God desires to bring you back to the way, the truth, and that's his son, Jesus. So when you and I I reject God's truth, something else has to take the spot. Now, there are not many truths in this world. There's just God's. So if I reject God's truth, whose truth am I accepting? Right? Do you know what the opposite of truth is? Lies. Lies. Falsehood. That's the, yeah, that's the opposite of truth. It's falsehoods, fairy tales. When you and I reject God's truth, we open ourselves up to receive Satan's fairy tales. Satan's lies. Satan's plans. Satan's agendas. And this is what I want you to know. When you and I reject the truth, we are, we are putting ourselves in a spot to experience destruction in our lives. Because that's, Satan, that's always Satan's end game. To destroy This is what I want you and I to see as God's children. Now, it's true that we are saved. It's true that we are sealed by the Spirit of God. That yes, like Satan is not going to bodily possess us, but if we walk in a life of disobedience and reject God's truth, Satan will happily help us destroy ourselves. And much like Judas, right? You can't say, I'm the victim here. It's like, you're choosing to disobey God. Satan is more than willing to help you do it. And we open ourselves up for destruction that is unnecessary, And so I would encourage you guys with this, and I want you to write it down and truly ask yourself this. Write this question down to reflect on later. Am I rejecting God's truth? Is there any area, any place in my life where I am rejecting God's truth? And if if you would say, yes, there is, then I would encourage you to ask this. 
what lie have I believed instead? You know, I was just even thinking about our culture. And probably the biggest example in our culture and the biggest example in the human race is uh, things that are sexual, right? God has some very black and white standards on that. God has some very definitive truths about the way you and I conduct ourselves sexually. And yet when you look at our world, it's just this big gray wash mess of whatever feels right to you. And yet you and I know, and some of us have experienced it, that when we get out in that gray wash and mess, what happens? We get damaged. Guys, God has truth for a reason. And when you and I receive and abide by and walk in God's truth, it actually produces beautiful, incredible, satisfying things in our life. And that's why God gives us these things. Because God desires that our lives would be fruitful, that our lives would be abundant, that our lives would be good. But when you and I reject that truth, we set ourselves up to receive the lie. And like Adam and Eve, when we buy into Satan's life, we lose the good things that we had. Because that's what sin does. Sin destroys. And it robs. And it takes away. And Judas is going to lose everything. Before this is said and done, Judas will be so low, he's going to kill himself. Which is the ultimate lie Satan will give someone, that your life is not worth living. His life was destroyed. When it says that Judas departed and it was night, now that isn't a notation of the day, but knowing John's gospel, it was also a notation of what Judas was entering into. Like darkness was settling on him and that darkness would consume him. And not only that, that darkness would hang on the world for three days until the glorious sunrise of Jesus' resurrection. Night was falling. My friends, are you rejecting God's truth? And if you are, what lie have you believed instead? And are you willing to let go of that lie, repent of it, and receive what's true again today? And that's God's heart for you. And this is what I know from the Bible. God says this, that he can restore the years the locust has eaten. And you're like, he's pulling out a bug reference on a Sunday morning? Okay. Locusts were a sign of plagues and judgment. And what God is saying is though your life may have been ravished by the sin, though destruction may have entered in because of the way we have chosen to live, when we repent, he is capable of redeeming and restoring time to us and restoring good things to us again. So Judas receives the bread and it's almost like, it's almost like that was his last opportunity. And you almost wonder, could Judas have repented at that point? Like nobody knew it was him. That was between him and Jesus. He could have changed his mind, I guess, and no one would have known. And not only that, Satan is right clawing at his door and yet the son of God was sitting right next to him. Like if he wanted to resist Satan and be free, he could have. And yet Judas takes the bread Verse 13, having received the priest of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. And by the way, we didn't start the timer this morning, so I have no idea. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep preaching. Verse 31, so when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified In him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. You're like, Jesus, my brain hurts. Like, you gotta wonder how the disciples felt, right? They're trying to absorb all this information, and Jesus is using these plays on words, and they're like, Lord, slow down. And yet, the Spirit of God was gonna open their understanding. This is what I want you to see. There's this tense moment where Jesus is like, one of you is gonna betray me, and he's deeply agitated. And John says, who is it, Lord? And I want you to imagine this moment with me. Jesus dips the bread. Remember, he's leaning on the table. He hands it to Judas. And he tells Judas, what you do, do quickly. And I want you to understand, when Jesus said that, who did he say it to? Did he say it to Judas or Satan? 
both. This is what I want you to understand. Satan was powerless. Judas couldn't betray Jesus until Jesus gave him permission to. Isn't that wild? Like here was Judas breaking this deal. Here was Satan thinking, thinking he had a way in, but they were powerless until Jesus said, you're free to go now. You're free to betray me. Like Jesus is in total command. And they leave and something changes. It's like the tension breaks and now Jesus is celebrating. Look at what he says again with me. He says, now, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. Because Jesus knew when Judas left that things were set in motion that could not be undone. Judas was going to go to the religious leaders. They were going to get soldiers. They were going to come out and get Jesus. All he had to do was wait. It was like that final saga, that final few steps to the cross. The gear started turning towards it. And in that, Jesus rejoiced. And I want you to see this, that Jesus saw the cross as an instrument of his glorification. And not only that, he saw it as a display of God's glory. That as the son of God would hang on the cross for the sins of the world, that the love of God and the kindness of God would be displayed for all to see. And in that, the son of God would be glorified and the father would be glorified through it. And not only that, Jesus says, if God is glorified in him, speaking of Jesus, God will also glorify him in himself, Jesus and the Father, and glorify him immediately. Jesus also understood that his obedience was the path to glorification. That when I obey the Father, Jesus says, the Father is glorified in me. Well, that's me preaching back there. <laughs> Somebody add an amen to that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. People on live stream are like, what are they talking about? All right. So, so when, I, when Jesus obeys the Father, the Father is glorified through his obedience. And not only that, the Father in turn will glorify the obedient Son and exalt him back to the place where he once sat on the throne, surrounded by angels crying, holy, holy, at the right hand side of the power. Jesus goes, I'm going to be glorified and glorified immediately. And in that, Jesus was looking to his death, to his resurrection and to his ascension, where he would sit down on the throne again with the Father. And the day would come when, Je when Jesus will still receive from the Father the kingdom that he will set up on this earth. Guys, Jesus saw his cross as a means of glorification. Jesus saw obedience as a form of being exalted by the Father. How do you see it? You know, so often we look at our trials and our troubles and we look at the things God's calling us to step out and obey and we don't realize that God wants to, God wants to actually bless us and in some ways honor us through that. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, there are no crown wearers in heaven who are not cross bearers before. Isn't that a good quote from Spurgeon? Write it down. There are no crown bearers in heaven who are not cross bearers before. And when Jesus practiced the ultimate obedience and the ultimate humility that he would empty himself, that he would become a man, he would come to this earth and he would obey the father to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Paul says that the father would super exalt Jesus. And Jesus would be given the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Jesus' victory is our victory, friends. Jesus went to the cross on our behalf. So I hope you feel assured this morning that the highest being in this universe is your Lord. Like there's no one bigger and not only that, when Satan comes, he has to get permission from him first. And so you and I are to be assured that God is in charge of our lives, that we can trust him, that when we get into sticky situations, Jesus knows how he's going to get us out. And so Jesus says to them, little children, this is our last point, and we'll close up in the last two verses. I shall be with you a little while longer and you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, 
that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is so powerful. Jesus in this moment of just excitement looks at his disciples, his sad, disheartened disciples. And he goes, guys, I'm gonna be with you just a little while longer. And I want you to put yourself in their perspective. They actually thought Jesus was gonna overthrow Rome still. Like their whole world is coming to an end. Like everything they held onto and held dear is falling apart in front of them. And Jesus is excited about it. And he's like, look, where I'm going, you cannot go. He's speaking of his death, that in his death, Jesus had to bear our sin alone. You and I can't even bear our own sin. Jesus went it alone to the cross. But he's also talking about his glorification and resurrection that was happening. They weren't gonna follow him now. He tells them in chapter 14, look, I'm gonna go prepare a place for you because you're gonna follow me later. Someday you're gonna be with me and we're gonna be together forever. But right now you can't follow me. So look at what he says. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you and that you also love one another. If that verse is not underlined in your Bible, would you underline it right now? Because this is your one command from God. Paul would write in Romans later that love is the fulfillment of the entire law because a person that loves God and a person that loves others does no evil or harm towards others. Jesus says, I want you. Now I want you to see Jesus extending this call from the page from 2,000 years ago to you right now. Jesus is speaking to you. A new commandment I give to you that you would love one another as I have loved you. My friends, you and I don't see it this way and I want you to write this down, but we are meant to be extensions of God's love. We are meant to be extensions of God's love and this is what I mean by this. I remember being a kid and I had lots of siblings. There's seven kids in my family, seven kids six of whom are boys. So when my parents left, sometimes they would just call us and be like, hey, you know, we said we were leaving. We're not going to be home for three days. We've ordered pizza. You know, make sure this happens, right? They needed a break as we got older. But I understood that when my parents left and they would look at you and they would say, Cody, you are in charge, right? They never actually said that to me. They're like, you're kind of in charge, you have two older siblings that if all else fails, you should be in charge, but all shouldn't fail, all right? But if it does, we're counting on you, kid, right? So I understood that they expected me to extend the same kind of love and care that they felt towards my siblings. It's almost like the extension of a, like, a, like OSU. If OSU had an extension here, OSU, uh, Oregon State University, you would expect the same quality and the same line of education that you would at SOU. Did I say that wrong? OSU, thank you. Gosh, this is why you shouldn't make up illustrations on the spot. All right? Or if you had an extension of a hospital. I remember we were so excited when the local hospital in my small town got uh, uh, bought out by the big hospital in Salem. We're like, yes, because now all the money and all the resources and all the doctors could come to our little town, right? You would expect to find the same kind of care from the Salem hospital that you would now at the Dallas hospital. Jesus is looking at you and I. He goes, I am leaving. But part of my plan, because life is going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. You got to live through this life without me here physically. Though the Spirit of God is inside of you, he hasn't gotten to that yet, but he's going to. You're here with the Spirit of God and you're here with one another. It's more encouraging to know that we're here with the Spirit of God than it is to know we're here with each other. But Jesus says, you're here with each other. And I expect all of you, my children, to show the same kind of love towards one another that I am showing you. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? He's making sure that there is a network for his disciples to experience his care even after he's gone. That though Jesus left physically, 
He's left his church here in his place. And he calls you and I to be his hands and his feet. He calls you and I to be campuses of his mercy and of his hope and of his love. He he calls you and I to be the extension of his love towards others, towards one another. Guys, I was so convicted by this when I read this. Because you know what question's coming up. Am I an extension of God's love towards the body of faith? Towards the unknown believer that I meet along the way? Towards my own wife and kids? Can I actually say I'm the extension of Jesus' love to them? Like they would look at me and say, Cody is the extension of Jesus' love towards me. Because that's what Jesus is calling us to. That when people encounter us, it would be, they would be receiving the love of Christ through us. That's a high call. And that's why we need the Spirit of God to do it. We can't do it in our own strength. Because Jesus' love is a love that would even give itself for the benefit of another. Even give itself to the, to the point of death to serve another. And Jesus is saying, just as I have loved you, I want you to love each other in turn. See, he's building on this idea that he started earlier on in this chapter when he said, just as I have done to you, John 13, where he washed their feet, I want you to do the others. He's going to keep building on that. This is your command. That you would love one another as Christ loves you. And that comes before opinion. It comes before your political opinion. It comes, before, uh, it comes before your personal feelings. It kind of trumps everything. You fill in the blank. Jesus' command comes first. Before our emotions, before our expectations. That when people turn to us in need of Jesus' love, that they would find it. Whether that's your wife, whether that's your kids whether that's a coworker, whether that's a hurting believer that God's placed in your life for you to minister to, whether it's someone in this church, you are called to be the extension of his love towards them. Powerful, isn't it? Lord, help us. And I'm so grateful that there's God's grace to help us through. (laughs) Because when when I see that, I look down and go, man, I have a long ways to grow. 80% of you are like, yeah, you do. <laughs> and I'm looking at you going, yeah, you do, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's close this out. Praise God for his grace. He says, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not only... Are we to be the extension of love, Christ's love towards one another? But Jesus says when we do it, it will be the undeniable mark in our communities that we are the people of God. Worship team, do you want to come on up, Justin? And we can go ahead and close our Bibles and bow our heads. And even while they're coming on up, Chris is going to go ahead and just play something on the guitar. And we're just going to, we're just going to sit before the Lord for just a moment. And one, one of the things I loved about this message is how deep the reflections are in it. Just all those questions. That, are there places in my life that Jesus is assuring me that it's okay and I need to let go and trust him? Or have, or have I bought into the lie? Have I rejected God's truth? And Jesus is calling me to repent of it today and believe what's true. Am I setting myself up for destruction? And lastly, am I fulfilling my calling to be an extension of God's love towards others? God, these are heavy questions. Lord, and the reality is, is 
We probably have areas in all three of those categories where we need your help today, Lord. I know I do. And so God, I just wanna pray right now just for your mercy, just for your grace, just for your strength, that you would help me, that you would help us, Lord. God, I know that you don't condemn us. God, you even say in your word that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk, according, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That God, Satan would love to condemn us and accuse us, but Lord, you are the one who has forgiven us and justified us, not by our works, but Lord, by your sacrifice. And so God, I just pray, Lord, that we would trust you, that you would use us as a chance to draw us closer to you, Jesus, and you'd help us to get our hearts right with you because Lord, you desire our lives to be beautiful and fruitful. And Jesus, we want that too. So Lord, we trust you. Would you help us, Lord? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the ushers are gonna come around with communion and they're gonna pass it out. So go ahead and raise your hand up. If you didn't get communion yet, keep it up. And when you get that communion, hold on to it because we're gonna partake together and we're gonna have a chance to respond together as well.